mosquito. Hello everyone and welcome to the plant walk portion of the Native Landscapes for Birds class. My name is Mary Spolier and I'm one of the plant knowledge instructors. We're here today at Russ Pittman Park, which is an urban birding hotspot. It is located in the city of Bel Air, within the central loop of Houston, and only minutes away from the Texas Medical Center. Today we'll begin our plant walk by learning a little bit about this park and what makes it so attractive to birds. Then we'll look at many of the plants on our plant list and we'll wrap up with something very special. A local homeowner has redesigned her yard, her backyard, as a bird habitat, and it's quite lovely. I think you'll enjoy it. With me here today, but out of camera range because we're practicing safe distancing, is Mary Ann Beauchemin, another class instructor. Mary Ann is an avid birder and is here today to tell you about what makes this park so attractive to birds and why it draws so many birds and bird species. Hi, welcome to the Nature Discovery Center and Russ Pittman Park. Before we start our virtual plant walk today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the natural history and the human history of Russ Pittman Park. Before Europeans came here, this whole area, the park, Bel Air, and even most of Houston, was part of the Gulf Coast Prairie ecosystem whose dominant plants were grasses and wildflowers. So all the trees you see behind me now and the shrubs, they weren't here back then. There were large trees and shrubs along the year-round water sources like Braze Bayou, Buffalo Bayou, and the other bayous in the Houston area. And they just followed the edges of the water because that wasn't provided enough water for them to live year-round. The Karankawa people certainly roamed through this area and had seasonal camps on the sides of the bayou, like Braze Bayou. Later, European settlers and pioneers moved into the greater Houston area, and in the late 1800s, this area, in fact, all of Bel Air, was part of a large farm called Westmoreland Farms. It was mainly a dairy farm, but they also grew a lot of vegetables, and all of the food they produced was sold to people who lived in the then-growing city of Houston, about five miles away. In the early 1900s, Westmoreland Farm took this piece of property here and made it into an experimental farm. They planted the pecan trees that are here today as a pecan grove and a large vegetable garden. And they actually then sold those pecans and vegetables in season to people in the city of Houston. They wanted to show people what they could do with a four or five acre plot of land so they could sell parts of their land to people to use as a homestead. In 1925, Mr. Edwards, who was the owner of Sealy Mattress Company, bought this experimental farm for his country estate. He built the one-story house at the other end of the park, which is now the first floor of the Nature Discovery Center. And he had his employees sell the pecans and the vegetables that they were working on growing here at the trolley stop, which was just down at the end of Newcastle Street where it met Bel Air Boulevard. In 1929, Mr. Edwards sold this property to Mr. Frank Henshaw, who later became a mayor of Bel Air. And Mr. Henshaw didn't use it as an experimental farm. He used it just as his home and yard for his family. He had a large family, so he added the second story to the house that is now the Nature Discovery Center. Mrs. Henshaw planted ro rose gardens, peonies, wisteria, and the shrimp plant that are growing around the Nature Discovery Center even today. In 1981, the then elderly Henshaw children put up a for sale sign in the park. And it just so happened that an amazing woman with great vision named Hannah Ginsberg had just started a group called the Friends of Bel Air Parks who were building the first playground in the city of Bel Air on a little piece of property just across the street next to the swimming pool. She had to walk by this property every day on her way there, and when she saw the first sale sign, she decided to convince the rest of Friends of Bel Air Parks to raise $1.3 million to buy this piece of property, and they did. It was a real grassroots effort to raise the money for this park. They had yard sales, bake sales, and they had a great tie a green ribbon around your tree campaign for people who actually donated money to the park. They even gave kids who donated a dime or a nickel or a quarter in school, a little green ribbon to wear. Of course, 
Many of the major foundations in the Houston area donated more money, and Texas Parks and Wildlife gave us the first $500,000 for the property, so long as it would remain a nature center and a nature park in perpetuity. That is actually written into the grant so that this park can never be changed into baseball fields or soccer fields. It will always remain a nature park. On weekends, Hannah and her husband used to go out and collect native tree saplings in nearby Harris County where there are lots of woods. People also donated non-native plants. Tea's Nursery donated a lot of plants and just people who had gardens at home donated a lot of plants. Most of those plants were not native. The purchase of the park was completed in 1984 and in 1985 they started working on renovating the Henshaw House which was kind of falling apart at the time. They opened the Nature Discovery Center for the first time in 1988 and I was the first employee here. In 2008 I headed up a task force for the Nature Discovery Center to create a master plan for the park and as part of that master plan, we decided to remove most of the non-native plants in the park and replace them with native plants. Also as part of that master plan, we decided to create some habitat zones or habitat gardens that showed the plants that would be in this area as well as surrounding Harris County areas. The first habitat garden that we made was the Pocket Prairie, and it was the first Pocket Prairie in the greater Houston area. We, that pocket prairie was made with the help of lots of volunteers, but especially one volunteer who inspired the pocket prairie, Don Verser. As luck would have it, the history of this park actually was a great advantage for the wildlife that lives here now. The oaks and pecans and other native plants actually provide great amount of food for wildlife year round. So the oaks here actually leaf out early in the year, and when they have young tender leaves, moths and butterflies lay their eggs on them and as soon as those little leaves start to grow bigger they chew them up and that is in perfect time for spring migrants that are coming through. So the early migrants feed on the caterpillars mostly on the oak trees. The pecans get their leaves later in the spring so the moths and butterflies that lay their eggs lay their eggs when they first leaf out maybe mid-March to the first week in April. And those caterpillars are big and ripe for the picking right when the greatest number of migrating birds that eat insects like warblers, vireos, and other birds move through the park after they've crossed the gulf. They, they stop over here, eat lots of caterpillars so they can build up their body fat so that they can then migrate all the rest of the way to their nesting grounds in northern North America and Canada. Add to that many different species of plants here that provide fruits and berries, the grasses and wildflowers that provide seeds, and all of which provide even more insects for birds and other animals to eat, le leads to a great biodiversity of plants in this park. That makes this park one of the best urban hotspots in the inner city of Houston for birds and birding. We hope you enjoy your virtual plant walk today and I hope you find the time to come out here in person and visit this park and experience the plants and wildlife that live here and visit here during migration. Thanks so much. No, I'm for this shot, I'm okay. I put my hat somewhere. It's in the park, I think. Uh, here we have Indian blanket, Gallardia pulchella, this has a long blooming period. It blooms for months and months at a time, which is something I just love about it. And uh, when it's done, this is what the flower looks like when the ray petals fall off. <clears throat> and let's see, here's one that's kind of in an intermediate stage. And this is what it looks like when the seeds are mature. And you can let them fall to the ground and it will reseed. An individual plant doesn't live more than one season probably, but it reseeds readily. Here we have inland sea oats, Chasmanthium latifolium. This is a grass that you can grow in the shade which is unusual for grasses. Most of them want more sun. 
It makes these beautiful arching seed heads and they're, they're quite flexible. So they move in the breeze, very attractive. They start out green. They look like little oats. That's how it gets its common name. As they age, they will turn tan and uh, they will become brittle and shatter and fall to the ground. The seeds are very fertile and sprout readily. So you can use inland sea oats as a ground cover to cover large areas if you need to. Uh, and another thing I'll let you know is that these look great in a flower arrangement. So clip a few, put them in with your other flowers and they really add something. This is a pecan tree, which is a very tall, large, overstory tree. Its scientific name is Caria illinoisensis. And uh, one of the features, it has this large flakes of bark that kind of flow down the tree. It's a very characteristic bark. Pecan trees have compound leaves, and the leaves are, are eaten by lots of caterpillars. Pecans are one of the major reasons we have a lot of spring migrants stop in this park to eat the insects that are eating the young leaves that leaf out in mid-April. And the birds come in right about that time from mid-April to late May, at least the largest number of warblers and vireos, et cetera. So these provide a lot of food and nutrition and protein for the birds that are migrating further north to nest. Pecan trees, of course, also produce pecans. And a few birds, uh, namely in this area, blue jays, will go ahead and eat pecans. They'll peck at them until they crack open. They'll hold them in their feet, peck at them until they crack open, and eat the, the rich, protein-filled meat of the pecan. Spotted bee balm, Monarda punctata. And we are enjoying standing here watching the bees. These are native bees, eastern carpenter bee. And we had a very interesting, uh, we're not sure what it was, possibly a wasp, ignomen wasp. But this is how it gets its name, bee balm. So very attractive to bees. Look at this, look closely at this one, and you'll see how it gets its name. There are lots of tiny little spots on the flowers teeny tiny little spots. This is a perennial, so it blooms spring uh, and through the fall. You can trim it back after it blooms in the spring and it will rebloom again in the fall. They grow like a pagoda at the various levels and that's common to all the monardas. Some have more stories and some have fewer. Uh, I think there's one species in Texas that can get up to 13 layers. This one, not quite so many. Okay. That's just how monardas grow. But they're not in your cell parking lot, they're okay. <laughs> this lovely shrub is called Arrowwood viburnum or viburnum dentatum. And the species name dentatum comes from the edge of the leaves that have this serrated edge you can see against my finger here. The um, arrowwood part of the name actually comes from some of the long, straight stalks that, that come out of this bush, and they used to make um, arrows out of them. So that's where it got its name, common name anyway. Um, these are the beginning of the berries, but in late summer, and early fall they'll turn to a blue-black color and birds will eat them. And also the leaves are often eaten by insects and that of course birds eat the insects as well. Again you can see it's kind of a thick shrub and it's a great place for birds to hide when they're afraid of predators or to build a nest. The leaves in the late fall and into the winter also turn a kind of deep maroonish purple which is very lovely. Close by me. 
If you ever come bird watching in Russ Pittman Park at, here at the Nature Discovery Center, the Nature Discovery Center keeps track of the birds that people see here on the bird board so then when people show up they can see what's been seen recently. So as you can see on, on April 14th, all these birds were here. It was in spring, the middle of spring migration. And the little FOS means it was the first of season birds seen actually in this park. There may have been the same species seen somewhere else in the Houston area a few days before that, but in this park it was the first day it was sighted for that season. This tree is a Drummond red maple. Its scientific name is Acer rubrum variety drummondii. And it is a great tree to plant where there's a lot of water or it definitely needs to be watered a lot if you don't have a low spot with water. It also sends out a dense root mass so it's sometimes hard to plant other smaller plants underneath it. So if you're gonna do that, it's better to do it right when you plant the young tree and get them in there ahead of time. It flowers really early before the leaves come out in January into sometimes early February and it has small clusters of really bright red flowers but they're tiny but they actually attract winter hummingbirds to feed on the flowers. I have seen winter hummingbirds feeding on the flowers on this particular tree every winter here. So it's kind of neat and people don't usually think of them as hummingbird food but they're really good for winter hummingbirds. It also has uh, bright red seed pods called samaras, and in the, they're only bright red really when they first come out in the spring. Some birds eat them when they're young and tender like that, and they, the seeds are still forming, but they still have a lot of protein in them. And then the samaras get ripe later in the summer and fall off kind of in August, September time, and birds can eat those seeds as well. This tree is also a host plant for the morning cloak butterfly and the tiger swallowtail and the caterpillars then provide insect protein for birds to eat as well. Here we have Texas coneflower, Rudbeckia texana. This is a very special plant, grows only along the upper Texas coast. What I'd like to show you here is uh, uh, this is, at this time of year, it's kind of in between the first blooms, which are the biggest ones, have come and gone, and so we're left with the secondary blooms here. And remember, this is in the aster family, so it actually has two kinds of flowers, the uh, disc flowers in the center and the ray flowers coming out. And in the disc part, the brown ones are the flowers. So here at the top, it's green. And then, uh, so these flower from the bottom up. Here's one that's just starting. And it's all green right now. These bloom primarily in the spring, but if you cut them back, they can bloom again in the fall. You can either leave the seed heads, if you like a more natural look, you can leave the seeds to develop. It will take them several months to develop. Uh, small birds might come and eat them in the winter. It's a pretty stout plant. It does have pretty large leaves that come out on a long stalk-like thing. They're, uh, they're pretty tough, too. They're thick. During the winter before they bloom, these leaves will lie very close to the ground. It'll form a basal rosette. And then the bloom stalk comes up in oh, probably about March, starts coming up. Very stiff stalk. These are very erect when they're blooming. I think it's a gorgeous plant. So here is our tropical sage, Salvia coccinea, and this is growing in a bunch of other plants here at Russ Pittman. We're near the front of the house now. All the sages have square stems. You can feel that. And the reason I'm telling you is you can let the plant grow up tall. It can get oh, three feet tall or so. If you would like a shorter, shrubbier look, more compact look, you can cut it 
right above a leaf node and it will sprout out, send two sprouts out wherever you cut it. This is a great little flower for hummingbirds. It blooms, has a long bloom period, uh, will bloom several months out of the year. You can grow it in sun, you can grow it in shade. Uh, if you grow it in shade, I'd give it a little less water there. This is Black-Eyed Susan Rudbeckia herta. So herta means hairy, and if you look at the stems, undersides of the bloom and the leaves, they're all hairy, kind of almost a little bit prickly. This is a great little bloomer, has a long bloom period for many months, probably about 10 months out of the year it's blooming. I've had some that have bloomed even in January. Uh, you can, it doesn't live very long, but it reseeds readily. It will do a little bit better if it's given some shade from the afternoon sun. This lovely little understory tree is a Mexican plum, Prunus Mexicana, and it does not grow very tall. It has um, leaves that when they have a lot of, get a lot of sun, turn kind of mottly like this, but if it's in the shade, the leaves are actually greener. It is not a good tree to put in the full sun. It's better to have partial sun on this tree. Um, the berries here, the fruit, are little plums. They are not poisonous, they are edible, but they have full of seeds, so they don't really taste like a regular plum you would eat. They're a lot more sour. Um, I knew some people who have made wine out of them, though, and some people make jam out of them. And they are great food for wildlife, not too many birds in this area eat them, but squirrels eat them, a fox eat them, and um, some larger birds could eat them too. But they are full of seeds, and of course, the animals that eat them would disperse the seeds. They do have multiple trunks, oftentimes, and they do not ever grow really tall. As you can see, some of the leaves here have holes in them. They've been eaten by insects. And that's one of the best advantages for birds of this tree, for this tree. It's in the prunus family, and plants, trees in the prunus family actually provide a lot of interest for many different types of insects, and those insects in turn provide food for birds. And now we're visiting American Beauty Berry, Calicarpa americana. This is a lovely arching shrub. It has a very loose habit. What's beautiful about it are these gorgeous purple berries. And there's like a ring, a donut around the stem, every place where the leaves come out at every node. And I wanted to show you this one because I can tell someone's been visiting, been eating these berries. Mockingbirds love them. This is a deciduous plant. It will drop its leaves in the winter. Oh, look, we have some blooms here. So, I don't know if you can see these together, the blooms and the berries. Occasionally, uh, you can find in the wild a white berry, but really I think the purple ones are prettier. And uh, like I said, mockingbirds just love them, so the fruit is great for birds. We're here because this is a thicket with lots of layers in it. And thickets are important places for birds to feel safe in or nest in. All the layers, starting with low layers of shrubs and higher layers of shrubs, and then on up to the overstory trees, are important, kind of like a staircase, for birds to feel safe in. In this particular thicket, we have a lot of different kind of shrubs. We have yopon and possum haw. We have woolly bucket. We have some sugarberry trees, some cherry laurel trees growing in there, and some palmettos down on the ground. They're all kind of close together, so they make a great thicket that leads up to the overstory trees of pecans and a live oak nearby. Yeah, 
I'm standing in the middle of a sugarberry tree, sometimes also called a hackberry tree. Its scientific name is Celtis levigata. And a lot of people consider this kind of a trash tree or they don't like it. They're very common. The seeds are always planted by birds all over the place. But it's actually a fantastic tree for birds and wildlife. Over 88 species of wildlife feed on this tree. Some of them are insects, but many of them are birds. It produces little bluish berries that are really sweet and very high in fats. So it's a very good tree for resident birds, winter visiting birds, and also just migrating birds in the late fall. It also is a host plant to several species of butterflies, including morning cloak and snout butterfly. And all the caterpillars, of course, provide excellent protein for birds, both in migration and year round. By the way, a lot of birds that you don't think eat insects actually need to feed insects to their babies in order for their babies to grow up to be adults. Even cardinals, hummingbirds, for example, also have to feed insects to their babies or else their babies will never survive to adulthood. So trees like this one that have a lot of larvae on them are great food for all kinds of birds, not just insect eating birds. When sugarberry trees are young, their bark is very bumpy, has lots of little knobs on it. As they get a lot older, they still have a few bumps and knobs on them, but not anywhere near as many. So the younger ones have more bumps and the older ones have less. I am standing here next to a smallish Carolina cherry laurel sapling. The scientific name is Prunus caroliniana, and it has Sp uh, spikes of white flowers about two inches long in the springtime that are very pretty. And those, from those white flowers in the fall, we get spikes of blue berries that are one of the favorite food for wintering birds here in the park. The other great advantage that this tree has is, is that it's a native evergreen tree. So it keeps its leaves year round. It is thicket forming. It doesn't get too tall. Maybe the tallest it would get is 35 or 40 feet. And it keeps its leaves year round, which provides really good shelter for wintering birds. Especially uh, screech owls hide in them here in the park. And they need some kind of evergreen tree to hide in. And this is a good one for them in the winter because there's a dense coverage, especially when they form a thicket. This is a gum bromelia, sometimes called woolly bucket, and the scientific name is Sideroxylon lenuginosum. And sometimes it gets its name from the underside of the leaves that are very hairy and woolly. Um, you can see here that some insects have eaten the leaves, and so it does provide insect food for birds. Also, it provides um, great thicket cover for birds to nest in and to hide in from predators. So it is one of the small understory trees that is really underutilized that makes a good thicket when mixed with other shrubs like yopan. Um, one other thing about them is they usually are multi-trunked, so they, they, they grow their own thickets. And also sapsuckers have been known to uh, work on the bark and drill their little holes in them and come back and feed on them. This is a shrub or small tree, depending on its height, and it has many common names. It's called possum haw, sometimes possum haw holly, or deciduous yopan. Its scientific name is Ilex decidua. And it is related to the Ilex vomitoria that we are seeing on this field trip, too. It has kind of oval or ovate shaped leaves, and these leaves, as you can see, have lots of holes in them from caterpillars. It has over 45 species of caterpillars that feed on it, so it provides a lot of insect food for many birds. It also has red berries in the winter, but unlike the Ilex vomitoria, Ilex decidua loses its leaves, so you'll see bare sticks with lots of red berries on them, where the evergreen yopan has, holds its leaves all year round and has the red berries. So lots of birds feed on those berries, thrushes, um, 
cardinals, titmice, mockingbirds, even blue jays, and then many, many birds also feed on the insects that feed on the leaves, like vireos and warblers. This is called yopon, sometimes it's called evergreen yopon, and the scientific name is Ilex vomitoria. It got its name vomitoria because the Native Americans that uh, lived where it grew used to brew a tea with it, and they would drink lots and lots and lots of that tea. A little bit of uh, yopon tea does not make you sick, but they would drink lots of it till they would purge themselves, and they'd do this before ceremonies a lot of times. Anyway, this is a great shrub to, to, to small tree for um, birds. Birds, uh, it is multi-trunked, so birds, it, it forms a thicket and birds like to nest in those thickets. It also has, you can see little, right now we have little green berries on here and in the winter they will turn red and lots of birds love to feed on this. The thrushes, like robins, and certainly these particular ones are filled usually most years with cedar wax wings feeding on the berries. Uh, squirrels, of course, will also eat the berries. Sometimes they get to them before the birds can eat them. These yopon right here are really old yopon, so they have grown really, really tall, partly because it's a shady area and they're growing up to light, but also because they're very old. We bought this park in 1984 and these Yopon were already here before that. Okay, here we have Cherokee sedge, Carex cherokeeensis. This is one of the tallest of the sedges, but still only gets, you know, maybe about a foot or so tall, not including the bloom stalks. Cherokee sedge blooms about April through June. And the flowers are interesting in that the male and the female parts are actually separate. The male is this part up at the tip, and these are the female flowers down below. And it's from the female flowers that the seeds will develop. This mighty oak is a willow oak, scientific name Quercus felos. It got its common name from its leaves. Its leaves are long and thin, very much like a willow. And these leaves are a lot thicker and shinier, but otherwise they're shaped like a willow leaf. It produces a lot of smallish acorns, and a lot of mammals like squirrels eat them, and also some birds like blue jays eat them. And it is also a host plant for a lot of butterflies. So a lot of birds feed on the insects that feed on it. In fact, oaks in general, including the willow oak, provide a lot of insect food for birds. Okay. This lovely little shrub is coral berry, Symphoricarpus obiculatus. And it is in the process of making berries right now. It has flowered. And these little, little things on the underside will become the berries. It makes uh, tiny little berries, about like so, maybe a quarter or to a third inch in diameter. They're a beautiful magenta color. They are so really attractive. You can use this plant as a, a you know, understory, shrub, very low shrub. It can get taller if it gets more sun. You can also use it as a ground cover if you need to cover uh, large areas. It does something really interesting in the spring. It will send out long, flexible runners, and that's how it spreads. So the runner will come out. They can be quite long, uh, you know, six, eight feet easily. And where it touches the ground, it will put out roots and create a new plant. I am standing in the middle of a parsley hawthorn. The scientific name is Crategus marshallii. And it got its name 
of parsley hawthorn from the parsley shaped leaves that are on the plant. It does have little thorns and these little thorns help, um, help protect the plant from getting eaten and also it, in a thicket it can be a great place for birds to nest and it can keep some predators away because of the thorns as well. You can see here that there's a few little berries forming. They have white flowers in the spring with red stamens sticking out. It's kind of a pretty little flower. And then these berries right now are green, but come fall, late fall and winter, they will turn bright red. And birds love to eat those as well. They also eat the insects that eat the leaves. And it is a butterfly larval host plant. Well, towering above me is a large loblolly pine. The scientific name is Pinus tata, and it is a really mature tree. It's been here for a long time. It is a great tree for birds to just uh, land in. We have Cooper's hawks that nest in this park for the last six years, and it is one of their favorite trees to bring their food to and eat because it has really large, almost horizontal branches that have a lot of space between them so they can fly in without getting in a lot of small branches and sit on a nice big branch and tear apart the birds that they've caught to eat. Um, it is also a host plant for the elf and the southern pine sphinx. And those larvae uh, are also eaten by birds. It is also a tree that I look at in the wintertime for pine warblers. The pine warblers are named for pine trees because they are often, not always, but often found in pine trees. So whenever I'm walking around the park, I always stop and look in the wintertime for our winter visiting pine warblers. Put this here, I don't know, do it like that or just leave it? Uh, if you come. This is a live oak tree above me here, Quercus virginiana. And it is a fantastic tree for birds. Actually, all the oaks are fantastic trees for birds. There are over 400 species of insects that feed on oak trees. And um, all those insects are great food for birds, both in migration and then summer, winter, all year round. Oak trees, as you know, produce acorns as well. And acorns are high and fiber and fats, which are good for some birds like blue jays eat the acorns and um, lots of squirrels, of course, eat acorns um, and some other birds as well will poke on and eat acorns. They also, one unusual use for acorns as food is something you might not think about is when the acorns fall out of their caps, the little caps stay on the tree and there's a little bit of sap <clears throat> and sometimes water collects in them and hummingbirds in fall migration feed all over the acorn caps. You can see them drinking out of the acorn caps. You were telling me something. And it does have a, a oh, strong, fra fragrance. very sweet fragrance. Didn't this you? is buttonbush or Cephalanthus occidentalis. And it is a nice little shrub that also can be multi-stemmed. Uh, it is a shrub that can grow either in water. This one's right at the edge of our little pond or and it can grow even in the water about one feet, foot deep. It can also grow on just solid ground, but it does like moisture. It does not do well in a really dry location. So it does like to have at least occasional or seasonal moisture. It might be good near a drain spout um, that gives it extra water uh, from your house or, or your garage or something. And it has these wonderful little white, tiny white flowers that form together in a ball and, and make a whole sphere of projections of pistils and stamens, which is kind of neat looking. The flowers actually are magnets for many kinds of insects, especially butterflies and moths, but also it's a bee magnet. Uh, I have seen also bee flies on it. And the other thing I've seen on it uh, amazingly in this park is we sometimes get a whole bunch of walking sticks over the branches for some reason. And it's something I haven't read, but we've noticed it here in the park. A walking stick is an insect that looks like a broken twig. They have very little skinny legs and a kind of just long broken twig-like body. 
the females are kind of long, maybe up to six inches or so, and the males are very skinny and short, maybe two inches at the most. Hi, this is a nice little understory tree called rough leaf dogwood or Cornus drummondii. And it is a really neat little tree. It can either have one trunk like this one does, or it can be multi-trunked. And one of the nice things about the multi-trunk part is that you can make a nice little thicket with them. Uh, we have one here that was mowed down accidentally by the mowers and it, I thought it was going to die and instead it became a nice multi-trunk uh, rough leaf dogwood. So as you can see here, a lot of the leaves have holes in them where the caterpillars have eaten and that provides good food for birds. They also have fl white flowers in the spring and those turn into nice little bluish berries in the fall that are very high in calories for fall migrating birds. And the leaves also turn kind of reddish in the fall. So it's a really great little tree and you can keep it pruned down as a shrub if you want to. This is a red mulberry, a native red mulberry, Morris rubra. And it is really hard to find native red mulberries. One thing you want to look for is you can notice that the bark on the base of this trunk is not orangey, like the white mulberry or the hybrid mulberry. And most of the leaves on this plant are entire, not lobed. There may be a few lobed ones, but almost all of them are entire. Red mulberries are really prolific in fruit, and the fruit is ripe in the late spring. It first turns red, but it's not really ripe till it turns like dark purple. And many migrating birds love to eat this fruit, uh, and also native resident birds. So mo mockingbirds will eat them, and all the really beautiful fruit-eating birds that migrate through in the spring eat them. So this is a great tree if if you to plant if you want to have summer tanagers and scarlet tanagers which are red baltimore orioles and other orioles which are bright orange and yellows and um, then there's many thrushes that eat it as well in migration the fruit goes fairly fast the larger the tree and the older the tree the more fruit it produces um, it also has insects that feed on the leaves and some birds will eat the insects off the twigs and trunk and leaves. With the lobes and all? I'd like to talk about this non-native mulberry to help you shop and make sure that you get the right plant if you're looking for a mulberry. So this is a hybrid mulberry. It's uh, probably mixed with an invasive one and you're probably wondering, how do I know that? Well, two things. One is the lower bark, the bark on the lower part of the tree is very, very orange. And you can especially see this orange coloring in the crotch places. So look for, make sure when you're shopping for a mulberry, make sure that you do not see this orange color on the trunk. And another thing that I see on this plant is lots and lots of lobed leaves. I see more lobed leaves than anything else. And it's not that the native can't have lobed leaves, but uh, on the native one, the leaves are primarily entire or no leaves. So if you see a bunch of lobed leaves and orange bark, you know you're looking at a non-native mulberry. This is scarlet buckeye, Esculus pavia, variety pavia. This is a small tree. Uh, it will only get to be about 20, maybe 25 feet. It's, uh, so it's an understory tree. Some things to look at here. It has a beautiful palmate structure to the leaves. Palmate meaning like the palm of a hand radiating out from one point. Uh, 
This has beautiful blooms. Older trees may start blooming in late January. Younger trees might not start until February, maybe mid-February or so. And then by the end of March, they're done with their blooming. A really great place to see these in bloom is at Brassus Bend State Park. Go on the Red Buckeye Trail. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's like a little forest of these trees. This, will, uh, this is deciduous. It will lose its leaves in the summer. It doesn't like the heat. Uh, it will drop the leaves earlier if it's dry and will hold on to them a little later if the weather is uh, wetter. The way you know, so you might think it's dead, but it's not. <laughs> and one thing to keep an eye on is the little bud tip. And if this tip is intact and it uh, is still there, still looks like it's healthy, in other words, it's not dry and crumbly looking, then the tree is fine uh, and it is still alive. Do I say, do I greet you or? Mary Spolier? Yeah. This is, this is Mary Spolier reporting from the Russ Pittman Park Pocket Prairie. And here with me now is Seaside Goldenrod Soledago Sempervirens. And uh, what I'd like you to notice about this is how the leaves clasp the stem. That's one way to identify it. And the leaves are smooth. This is one of only two goldenrods that we recommend for your home garden because it does not spread like by root runners like canadensis does. This is the one that you most commonly see uh, along the roadsides. This one is very, very, very spready. Notice how it holds its leaves differently. Uh, the leaves are larger. These leaves have a little texture. You don't want this one in your garden. This one is about two to four weeks from blooming. It is a fall bloomer, great pollinator attractor, uh, attracts lots of butterflies, bees, bumblebees. Um, <clears throat> this is a really good one to have in your garden for your fall blooms. Uh, as you might guess from the name, Seaside Goldenrod, it is very often found uh, along the shore. In, on beaches. It's really good at stabilizing sand dunes. It is also found, common to find it, in prairies. So it's also a prairie plant. This little uh, grass, I don't think this is made. No, oh, I know it's not. It's just... And here we have Maximilian sunflower or Helianthus maximilianii. This is just really getting started in its growth. It, it is a fall bloomer. It will, can eventually get to be uh, quite tall, six to eight feet tall. If you, so it's something that uh, with its height would be good in the back of a border. It is uh, interesting in that it blooms along the stem. So you'll get a long, tall spray of these beautiful yellow flowers. I want you to look at the leaves because that will tell you the difference between this sunflower and the others that we have in the class. The leaves are fairly broad, have a deep V, and they're arched. They do have that typical sunflower texture, kind of rough sandpapery texture. So if you uh, like something shorter, you can cut this back. So if I wanted uh, something about this tall, you could go ahead and snip it, and it would branch out at the uh, little leaf nodes. It will make seeds about, um, about October, November, and uh, birds can use them. The sunflowers differ in the moisture that they like. So Maximilian prefers a uh, well-draining soil, uh, on the little bit on the dry side if you have it, otherwise well draining will do. The swamp sunflower likes wetter conditions and the hairy sunflower can take some shade. So pick the one that works for your garden.
Here we have Liatris pycnostachia, common names Liatris, gay feather. It's an absolutely gorgeous plant, grows from a comb, like a little bulb. And in the fall, it puts out, late summer, early fall, puts out this amazing flower spike. It blooms from the top down. So this one's almost done. We caught it just in time to show you. It has really, uh, it has very, very hairy leaves. If you look at them closely, they have tiny little hairs that give the leaves a kind of a grayish, grayish green cast. These are very good at attracting pollinators. Butterflies just love these. Uh, I've seen the flower sp spikes just lined up with butterflies from one end to the other. And of course, wherever you have pollinators, you're going to have their larvae too, somewhere nearby. And uh, the birds will, will find them. This is one of my favorite plants. This is Liatris acidota, or sharp blazing star. So it's a cousin to the Kansas blazing star, or Liatris pycnostachia. This one's very special because it's endemic to this part of Texas, so it only grows along the upper Texas coast and in just a few counties. It has smaller, a, a more slender stem. The bloom spike isn't quite as dense as the other Liatris. And the leaves are very, very skinny, and they don't have the, they're not covered with the, the fine little hairs of the other one. So that's how you would tell the two apart. This is also a great pollinator plant and attracting all kinds of pollinating insects. And of course, the more bugs you have in your garden, the more birds you will have too. Okay, here we have little blue stem, Shizacrium scoparium. And it is one of the big four prairie grasses. It's the smallest of the four. So it doesn't uh, really compete very well in a tall grass prairie. But in the coastal prairies here uh, where we are, it's quite common. This one is bolting. It's getting ready to bloom. And one thing I think is really cool about this plant is that it's almost like Christmas. If you look up the stem, you've got alternating green and red which is kind of cool. This is a small plant, uh, and I have one, a larger one at home that I'm happy to show you. This grass, when it blooms, is going to have little, uh, little tiny white uh, fluffy bits all along the stem. So grasses differ in how they carry their blooms, just like Forbes do. And this one is distinctive when you're looking out across a prairie. Uh, this has a very distinctive look to it, very pretty. In the fall, the leaves will turn uh, not just tan, they'll turn, uh, they can anywhere from a rust color to a salmon color. Very attractive grass to have in your garden. By the way, I'm gonna be leaving here about the 20th to go to Colorado for a month to be okay? Here we have Virginia wild rye, Elemus virginicus. This is a cool season bunch grass. So what that means is that it produces its uh, leaves and its flowers when it's cool outside. So this one is in the process of going to sleep, going dormant, and there really isn't much to see by way of leaves. But here is the bloom head, and looks just like you might picture a rye wood. Now this rye, what distinguishes it from other, uh, the other native rye is that it tends to hold its seed heads kind of straight up. So this is a lovely grass to have in the winter to give you a little, uh, a little color and a little seasonal interest. This does well in part shade, so it does well at the edge of a wooded area. Uh, you can also put it in the sun, it will be fine there too and it will tend to disappear among your other plants as the season gets warmer.
This is frog fruit, Phyla nautiflora. A great little ground cover. It has these long stems and wherever they touch the ground, wherever these little nodes touch the ground, they can send out roots and that's how they spread. Uh, it uh, grows during the warm season. It, if we get cold enough weather in the winter, then it will uh, drop its leaves. Don't worry, it comes right back. What tells you this is not a flora is that if you can look closely, uh, you see teeth up here at the rounded end of the leaf, but the bottom part is smooth. So if it's smooth about halfway to two thirds of the way up, teeth at the tip, then it's Texas frog fruit. There are others uh, that are native. This is the one that we most typically find here. It has tiny little flowers. So as the flower matures, the bottom part gets longer and longer, and uh, it looks like a very tiny uh, cupcake. This is a great little plant for very small pollinators like surfed flies. It also attracts small butterflies like the Horace's dusky wing. This is a black willow, our native willow here, called Salix nigra. And it is a tallish tree here because it's reaching up to the shade. They don't always get this tall. They have a fairly open crown, again, letting some light in. They have kind of deep furrows, dark furrows in their bark, one of the characteristics that you can tell it by. And um, it is a kind of weak wood, so insects like to get in this wood, which turns out to be really good for birds like yellow-bellied sapsuckers that come here in the wintertime and feed, drill little holes, um, the sap it comes out of the holes and then the birds come back and feed on the insects that get stuck in the sap. So that's one bird that likes it. Also, it's a host plant for some different kinds of butterflies on the leaves. And um, I know in spring migration, yellow warblers love uh, to eat insects off of black willow trees, any willow trees really, and um, so do many other warblers. But yellow warblers are characteristically found in willow trees. This tree is our native birch. It's called river birch or Betula nigra. And it is uh, known for being multi-trunked and also for this lovely peeling birch kind of skin it has or bark that you can see pulls away and curls. It has kind of peachy colors and sometimes it's silvery and leaves exposed new bark underneath it. This tree is actually a really neat tree that has a more open kind of canopy than, rather than a dense canopy. And so it lets a lot of light come down to the plants below. So if you're looking for a tree for your garden that lets a lot of light down for plants you want to plant beneath it, this one is a really good choice. It has little seed pods in the fall and winter that have a lot of seeds that birds like to eat. And of course, it's a great tree for birds to perch on. Here we have Turk's cap, Malvaviscus arboreus variety drummondii. So one thing I want you to notice right away is that the flower stands upright. There is a Mexican variety that you might also see in the nursery called Turk's cap, but it's pendulifloris and it hangs its flower downward. So this is the native Turk's cap. This is uh, very attractive to hummingbirds. We also just watched a bumblebee nectar robbing on this. So, leaves are kind of fuzzy. This can spread. It's so we have it in the ground cover category. It's another plant you can use to cover large areas. Another really important aspect to attracting birds to your backyard is to have some kind of shallow water feature that birds can use. 
It can be as simple as a bird bath or a pan of water on the ground, or even something like this bubbling rock water feature. But it is also important to have a kind of layered area behind or on one side of it so that birds can have a place where they can sit and slowly work their way down to the water feature, looking around for predators like snakes or cats. And they always want to make sure that they're safe before they come down to drink or take a bath. This is an American sycamore tree. Its scientific name is Platanus occidentalis. And that's really important to remember the scientific name because it is really hard to find American sycamores anymore. All the nurseries sell Mexican sycamores because they are faster growing. This is a slow, slower growing tree, but they're not native to the United States. They're native to obviously Mexico. This, this tree produces seed balls that are ripe in the winter time. And it's a great food source for wintering goldfinch, American goldfinch that spend a lot of time in the south in the winter time. So I find them on the sycamore trees, usually January, February, and the beginning of March. It also is a plant that is eaten by lots of insects, and so the insect protein is also great food for birds. Are you done? You actually do have some muscles. That's a... <laughs> this is called hornbeam. Carpinus caroliniana, and it is also sometimes called musclewood. And it got the name musclewood from these muscle like striations that run all the way up the tree and the bark. That's really a telltale sign for this tree. I don't know of any other trees in the area that have these kind of big, muscly fibers on their bark. The trees provide, of course, um, habitat for birds to perch on. Birds will eat the seeds of the trees that come out in the fall and winter. And also, there are several species of butterfly that lay their eggs on these leaves. And so, of course, those caterpillars are food for birds and other wildlife. This is an American elm. Its scientific name is Omis americana. And it is a really nice tree. It produces a prolific amount of seeds, which a lot of birds feed on. Goldfinch, chickadees, even yellow rump warblers in the wintertime. And I've read that even wood ducks feed on it, so obviously that needs to be near water if wood ducks are feeding on it. But the tree itself doesn't need to grow near water. It is a larval host plant for morning cloak butterflies and many other species of butterflies. Fantastic. <laughs> what? And Dave Garden, Botanical Pronunciation Guide, agrees it's Michelei. This is wax myrtle, or Morella serifera, and it is a native shrub. It can grow actually much taller than this, but is easily trimmed back. We have trimmed this back so it got thicker and bushier. It's a great plant for birds in a couple of ways. The female plants, and there are both male and female plants, but the female plants produce berries, which some birds eat. And also, um, it has insects that feed on it that some birds eat. And last of all, if it's dense and cut back and thick, it provides a good shelter for birds for protection from predators or for nest sites. We hope you've enjoyed your plant walk through Russ Pittman Park, but now we'd like to take you to the home of Betsy Black, who has a wonderful backyard prairie that we'd really love you to see so you can see what you could do with your own backyard. My name is Betsy Black and we're standing in my garden and prairie that I started almost six years ago. We wanted it to feel like a park in here. I wanted it to feel like a park where people could walk around and look and see the different types of plants and say, oh, look at that, or see a bird or a lizard. It's my water feature for birds. I get a lot of birds, hawks will come down, get a drink, owls. I have a lot of warblers that come here for drinks, woodpeckers. Uh, a lot of different birds come for drinks here and 
I had a snake there getting a frog. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. You get a snake in here and sometimes I'll get a heron or something, a yellow crown night heron, come and sit on the fence. The layering of the plants, the birds are here on the water feature and they get scared they can go in there, especially if a cat or something comes. I don't know any animals, but if a cat comes they can go there or if something else comes, then they can keep going higher and higher to get away from who's ever coming to scare them. And then they can fly off, even up onto a wire. It's a chimney swift tower, and I've had three years, I've had chimney swifts come and nest in there. And this year we had five swift babies in there. It's been wonderful. I've laid on the ground and got videos of the babies. And I got videos of them building the nest and things like that. So it's been a lot of fun.